This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Vanuatu President Baldwin Lonsdale spoke Monday about plans to rebuild after Cyclone Pam. We have to be very careful how we build our houses, all in the infrastructure, how we build our infrastructure in place. We must have taken into account this disaster that has uh, happened to us so that we can build better infrastructure, better place for development in Vanuatu. Bill McKibben is joining us now, co-founder of 350.org, author of a number of books, including Earth, Making a Life on a Tough New Planet. Bill, we want to talk about a number of issues here, but can you start off by talking about what's happened in Vanuatu? 350.org is active there. Um, and how it links to climate change. Sure. Uh, we've been hearing sporadically from our uh, coordinator in Vanuatu, Iso Nime, who's been doing a lot of relief work as this uh, crisis has unfolded. The picture is, as you've been saying all morning, extraordinarily grim. But Port Vila, the capital city and the place with most of the infrastructure, took a huge hit. But the winds were higher, uh, the seas were higher. And the infrastructure much flimsier to begin with on many of the outlying islands. So the picture, I'm afraid, is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. The um, the tragedy, you know, it, the bottom line tragedy here, as in so many other places around the world, is that Vanuatu's development has been put back decades with those destruction of roads, bridges, hospitals, schools. Uh, uh, this is what's happening now around the world as people begin to kind of run on a tilted treadmill trying to develop on a disintegrating planet. And uh, the people in Vanuatu know I exactly what the culprit is. You know, in one of the most beautiful demonstrations of the climate change era, last summer, in Vanuatu and 10 other Pacific islands, uh, the Pacific Warriors, 350s Pacific Warriors, built indigenous traditional canoes and took them off uh, to Newcastle in Australia, the largest coal port in the world, and used them to blockade the great coal ships uh, uh, in an effort to demonstrate exactly what Cyclone Pam also demonstrated the incredible vulnerability of so many of the poorest people in the world to the rising temperatures that we're inflicting on our one Earth. Can you talk in a broader way about the threats that small island nations face? And then we're going to take this home, not to a small island nation, but to California, to talk about the issue not of too much water, but of too little. Sure. Look, if you're low to the water on an island nation and the sea level starts going up, uh, that makes everything that happens, every cyclone that comes, that much more dangerous. Even without a cyclone in the Pacific earlier uh, this month, the, the huge king tides in Kiribati flooded many, many uh, uh, homes and villages. Um, add to that things like the ongoing heating and acidification of the ocean's waters and the concomitant erosion of coral reefs around the world. In many of these nations, coral reefs provide the best defense against a raging ocean, and that defense is breaking down everywhere. Um, add to that the fact that we keep seeing these super typhoons, super cyclones. Uh, uh, you know, warm air holds more water vapor than cold. It allows in arid areas for more evaporation and hence more drought. And we'll talk about California in a second. But once that water's up in the air, it's going to come down someplace. And so we see from Boston, which just set yesterday the all-time record for snowfall, uh, uh, to places that are getting hammered by big storms, we're seeing more and more and more devastating downpour. Uh, this is a worldwide problem. But of course, places like Vanuatu are at the very sharpest end of the stick because they are so, so vulnerable. I want to ask you about another climate crisis closer to home. On Thursday, a NASA scientist wrote an op-ed in the Los Angeles Times headlined, California has about one year of water left. 
Will You Ration Now? Uh, Jay Famiglietti, who authored the piece, is the senior water scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Caltech, and a professor of Earth System Science at the University of California, Irvine. He wrote, quote, The simple fact is that California is running out of water, and the problem started before our current drought. NASA data reveal total water storage in California has been in steady decline since at least 2002, when satellite-based monitoring began, although groundwater depletion has been going on since the early 20th century. Right now, the state is only about one year of water supply left in its reservoirs, and our strategic backup supply, groundwater, is rapidly disappearing, he wrote. Bill McKibben. Hey, it's up and down the west coast of the United States. Yesterday, Washington state declared drought emergency over large regions. The snowpack in the Olympic Mountains is about 8 percent of normal. The snowpack up in the Sierra Nevada, which has to water pretty much all of California, is 20 or 25 percent of normal. We're in the fourth year of a drought, and the scientific papers published in the last couple of weeks said that California can really start expecting in our new climate regime that drought will be the new normal. Last year, the satellites indicated that California had lost about 63 trillion gallons of groundwater to evaporation. That took so much weight off the uh, crust there that the Sierra Nevada mountains jumped a, a half inch. Um, look, uh, uh, there's no there's no way that you can have civilizations of the kind that we've built in California without uh, without water. And there's less and less of it all the time. Uh, it's not just California. Go south to Sao Paulo, the fifth or sixth largest city in the world. People are there in a drought so desperate for water that they've begun to try and drill through the concrete in their basements looking for groundwater. Uh, there have been parts of the city that have been undergoing severe water rationing. This is what happens when you raise the temperature of the earth. There's no huge surprise in it. Um, uh, but it is horrifying to see it play out. As we speak, Oxford um, University in Britain is set to vote on a measure to divest from coal. The decision could come during our show. Meanwhile, the U.N. body responsible for global climate change negotiations is backing the fast-growing campaign persuading investors to sell off their fossil fuel assets. Nick Nuttall, the spokesperson for the U.N. Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, said, quote, we support divestment as it sends a signal to companies, especially coal companies, that the age of burn what you like, when you like, cannot continue. Well, at the U.N. climate talks in Peru in December, Democracy Now! senior producer Mike Burke asked U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon about the movement to divest from fossil fuels. Mike Burke from Democracy Now! in New York. Uh, over the past year, many churches, uh, investment funds and schools have joined a movement to divest from fossil fuel companies. And I'm wondering if you support this movement. It's encouraging these days that there is a great awareness and willingness that they are now investing their resources into more sustainable energy. Of course, you know, practically speaking, in our real world, this fossil fuel may have to continue to be used as our energy sources. That was the U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Again, uh, the U.N. body responsible for global climate change negotiations has just announced it's backing this fast-growing campaign persuading investors to sell off their fossil fuel assets. Bill McKibben, how significant is this? Is it a real shift? You know, I, I remain slightly in shock about the whole thing. Three years ago, it was a, a few of us, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote the first big piece about this for Rolling Stone magazine. At this point, this idea, this divestment idea, now encompasses great universities from Stanford to Sydney to Stockholm. It encompasses religious denominations, the United Church of Christ, the World Council of Churches. It, 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 there are cities like Oslo and Seattle. Uh, the um, um, 
the Rockefeller family, the first family of fossil fuel. Today, Oxford's taking a vote. In a couple of weeks, people are descending on Harvard. Uh, you know, all kinds of people. Al Gore, yes, but also a two-time Reagan appointee to the SEC. Also, Desmond Tutu, all Harvard uh, uh, alumni of one kind or another, demanding that the university uh, uh, sell its shares. So uh, this has become one of the many faces of the fossil fuel movement, the fossil fuel resistance. And it's very much hand in hand with those Vanuatuans standing up to the biggest coal mines in the world in Australia. Those coal mines can't be developed without the kind of financial lifeline that we're trying to cut off when we do things like divestment. So it's, you know, the, the news is very bad from the physical world, from what's going Going on in the, the surf and in the atmosphere and, 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 and in our drying reservoirs, um, at least the fight is fully underway. There's a strong resistance being mounted at every level. And the fact that the UN itself has now said we should be divesting from fossil fuel is just an indication of how powerfully people have organized around the globe. George Mambio just tweeted, I've pledged to hand back my degree if Oxford University does not divest from fossil fuel fuels, please make the right decision. Also, Harvard University, again, the divestment movement is launching the first week of April, continuing to push for it there. Yes, George Monbiot is going to hand back his Oxford degree, and, and uh, almost as powerfully, Natalie Portman has demanded that Harvard divest. So uh, uh, it's everywhere now, Amy.